All right, thanks. I want to start out by learning about you all. Um, and so actually, Zach asked my first question, but I've got a bunch more. Um, how many of you have thought maybe someday you would write a book? All right, not non-trivial. All right, um, how many of you know someone else who you think should write a book? <laughs> All right, that's, that's good. Um, how many, I'm going to shift gears here. How many of you are interested in product management and like stories about a product going from an idea to reality? All right, awesome. Um, how many of you are interested in an example of AI disrupting things? Fewer than I thought. All right, interesting. Um, how many of you like to win free stuff? <laughs> All right, now, last question. How many of you raised your hand for any of those questions or th should have? All right, awesome. This talk is for you. If you didn't raise your hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there's pizza and beer and other reasons for you to be here. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, and uh, I didn't actually start. This type talk might run a little long. I didn't start my timer. I'm starting 25 minutes now, whoever's tracking. Um, all right, so about me, um, since I learned about you. So I'm Rick Joy. I am the author of Inspiring Work Anniversaries. That's me wearing the exact same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that is totally planned. <laughs> so uh, I even ironed it. Special. I don't usually iron my shirts. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, and I guess the other thing is at one point I said, you know, anyone who likes to win free stuff, and some of you, that's the only reason why you raised your hand. Um, somewhere in this presentation, there is a unicorn hidden. Okay, if you are the first person to spot the unicorn, wave your hands, and yell unicorn, you will win. A copy, a, a, a not for resale promotional copy of my book. <laughs> so, uh, is, it, is it signed? Um, so I like to personalize my signing, and so I'm waiting to see who wins, and then it will be personally signed. Yes. So the stakes are high. Be looking for the unicorn. <laughs> um, all right. And to do that, you'll have to interrupt me. That's totally cool. It'll be fun. Joel? Uh, it, um, a, a kid would recognize it as a unicorn, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right. Um, all right, so, um, a little bit more about me. Um, this is the Amazon Hot New Releases page. Um, and this is my paperback at number one last month. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> More than that, this is my hardcover, also at number six. Wow. All right. Now, with all that applause, I'm like, this really isn't impressive. This is the office <laughs> management category, <laughs> um, which is really, really obscure. You can see there's like pocket calendars competing against this. Um, and it, this is in January after you should have already gotten your calendar. Um, Anyway, so important thing about this talk is I am not going to tell you how to be a bestseller. I'm not going to tell you how to quit your job to be an author. Um, instead, what this talk's really about is if you have some sort of specialized knowledge that the world could benefit from, how do you get that out in a high quality way? And as we've alluded to, like to a point where it's not just people who know you buying it, but strangers go, hey, that would be useful to me. And I would buy it. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, all right, so common advice is that a presentation should have one core message um, that was alluded to earlier. I'm just going straight at it. The core message is you could write and sell a book. Um, so at any point you get to where you'd want to share something. This is trying to build up your confidence. You can do it. Um, all right, so it may seem like a big task to write and sell a book, um, but like any big task, all you do is you break it down into simpler things and then smaller things, and those things become simple. Um, I'm going to break down the task into seven steps. So um, testing the idea, choosing how to publish, writing, um, editing and revising, designing the book, distributing, and marketing. Um, and I'm going to cover all of that material, <laughs> um, hopefully in the next 22 minutes, um, which is sort of like a ultra fast lightning talk on every one of those. Um, and um, at the, the other thing is, um, for those of you who raised your hand saying that you're interested in the AI side of this, um, right now you can't tell AI, you know, make a book from me on this topic available for people to buy. Like that's just too big of a thing that have AI do. Um, 
this starts to be like, how do you break the problem down into um, parts that AI can help with? And then for each one of these, we'll break it down a little further. And at the end, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but that's a way to think about it if you're in the AI camp as we go through. All right, so we're gonna start with testing the idea. I think of this as the most important step. Um, it may turn out that your idea for a book is a bad idea, nobody wants it. You may not even actually partway through decide that you wanna do it. Um, figuring that out early will save time. Um, and so um, the first step of testing the idea is to make it concrete. Um, and for that, the, the very simplest thing you do is two simple steps. So one is to pick a title. So without having a title to talk about, it's, it's not really a book yet. Um, and then the second thing is to write a table of contents. So you know, if you think you want to write a book, just do these two steps. If you can't do these two steps, you're, you're not going to get there. Um, you know, as my example, um, the title I went with back at that stage was Better Work Aversaries. Um, and so what you're going to pick for your title will not be your final title, and that's totally okay. Um, and this is the original table of contents I had. That's not what the actual table of contents looks like. Um, but from this stage, you know, you're now like, hey, this is the thing I'm going to try and put into the world. Um, and I would say the first place you want to test is with yourself. Um, and so there's four questions I'd recommend you ask. Um, one is, how is it different from existing books? And this is just go on Amazon and look for this book that you're imagining and see what comes up. Um, if the book's already been written, if there's a lot of books on it, there's kind of a question of why, you know, do you really want to do that or do you just want to be happy that book exists? Um, in my case, um, there are no other books about work anniversaries. You might be surprised. <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, which one of the real great advantages of that is my book, this, this, whoever the lucky winner of this will own the world's best book on work anniversaries. Um, so, and you can too if you can get the right answer to this question. Um, another question is why you, right? So what, you know, of all the people in the world that could write on this topic, why does it make sense that you do it? Having an answer to that is going to be motivational and it's going to help in the promotion. Um, in my case, this is a little bit weird, but I am the world's top work anniversary expert. So this question was simple, like who else would write it other than, than me? Um, similar to the book concept, I'm also the world's only work anniversary expert. Um, <laughs> um, all right, next question, why now? Um, this is very much a product type question of, you know, if, if the world hasn't had one before, why does it need it now? Um, having a good answer to that's useful. Um, in my case, this was related to me starting a business. Um, so having the book is useful for me promoting the business. So that a lot of times the answer might have something to do with the external world, like you know, some new technology comes out, that would be a good why now reason. Um, and then the last question is, is this worth hundreds of your hours? Um, and I picked this number because I would claim it, it would be really hard to imagine you writing a book in less than 100 hours. And having been through the experience, it's also not going to take you a thousand. So anywhere in between depends on how long your book is, how much effort you put into it. But that gives you an idea. Um, assuming you answer these questions and you're let go, you're thinking this is a good idea. Um, I would claim the next most important thing to do is to validate your idea with others, right? So this is like, hey, you're motivated to do it, um, but now um, motiv doing, getting others involved to figure out if they want it is useful. Um, so. Um, other people aren't going to care as much about your idea, and this will sound slightly ridiculous, but they're going to be a little less willing to actually read your table of contents. And so one recommendation I always make with ideas is make them as concrete as possible. And so for this, I'd recommend that you create a mock-up on Fiverr so people really get you mean you're going to write a book. Um, Fiverr is cheap. You can just create a bunch of different ones. You can pick your favorite. Um, and now you have something you put in front of people and say, like, hey, I'm, I'm going to do this book. What do you think? Um, now, armed with that, um, the next step, which I think is the really most important, we're going to come back to this multiple times in the talk, is find what's called beta readers. Um, these are what you might expect from um, you know, beta software. Um, the, so you take some early version of your book, and you're trying to find people who are willing to read it. And by read it, meaning read a Google Doc or read a Word document. Um, and you know, it's not formatted. It's not great. And so you like show people, hey, I'm going to do this thing. Would you read my rough copy? Now, one of the things is you don't actually try to get them to commit to read the whole thing. A really great trick with this is to say, could you read it the way you would read any other book, where if you get bored partway through, you just stop reading? So you're not saying, like, I hey, read my lousy book. It's like, open it up, read it. If it's useful to you, great, keep going. If it's not, stop. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more later, but that little step makes it really helpful. And you know. Some, if your book's interesting on a good, useful topic, people should be willing to say yes to that. 
Um, it is also possible you won't find any beta readers, and what you know that might mean you should pivot your topic to something that people are interested in, more interested in. Um, it might mean that maybe you shouldn't um, go ahead with the project because one thing I would claim is if you can't find beta readers, you're probably not going to find people who will buy the book, um, and you know that's a step. And um, the other thing is you might just go ahead anyway because you really want to write the book, but you won't be surprised when no sales come through or it's you know, just X mom um, who, who comes through. <laughs> um, so in my case, I found 46 beta readers, um, 30 of which actually beta read. <laughs> um, and that's completely normal um, and completely okay. You want lots of people signing up and then um, you know, some people will drop out. That's totally fine. Um, so that is, in summary, test the idea. So you know, figure out, you know, make it concrete, and then you know, make sure you want to do it, and then make sure other people want to read it. All right, so that was step one. On to step two, which is choosing how to publish. Um, so how to publish can be simplified into four categories, um, each with advantages and disadvantages. And there's no right answer of the four categories. It's whatever makes sense for your project. Um, a simple model for thinking about it is um, higher quality versus lower quality and someone else being in charge and you being in charge of the production. Um, and we'll just fill in the four things. So traditional publishing is going to be high quality and someone else is going to be in charge. Um, this is awesome in that it's prestigious and it's free up front. Um, it's not great in that it's hard to, um, hard to get someone to accept you. It takes a lot longer. From the time you finish your book to a traditional publisher putting out is going to be a couple of years, um, whereas with some of these other options you can get done in six to 12 months. Um, and um, you make a lot less for a book. Like one of the reasons why you're not paying to get the book out is because they're, you know, they're, they're investing in your book and they want to make a profit and make a bigger cut off of it. And, so, and even if you do really well, it's worse because much kind of like the venture capital world, they expect a bunch of books to fail. And so if yours is the successful one, they have to make a big cut off of that, take a big chunk of that to pay for all their failures. Um, so if you really know your book's going to be amazing and everyone's going to love it, you may not want to go with a traditional publisher. Um, so that's an option. Um, if you, um, you know, the other option in publishing is what's called vanity publishers. So here you just pay them and they'll publish any book, right? So it's simple, you write a check, you know, six to 12 months later, your book's out, it's all great. The really tough thing about this is they're not incentivized to do quality work. Um, so they wanna keep their prices low so they get more customers and then once you're in, they wanna do as cheap as possible so they get as much profit. Um, so that's a downside there, but it is simple. And for some projects, the quality may not matter that much. Um, you can also go with freelancers. Here we're on the side where you're in charge. So you can do a higher quality book than a traditional publisher by just hiring you know, essentially the same people that are in the publishing industry already, you know, the veterans who went independent um, and can do some really stuff. Great stuff here. Here you have the most control over quality um, and um, just creative control because no one of the publishers aren't rushing it through. We're saying what they think's best. You get full control, that's really great. Um, but you do have to manage a bunch of freelancers um, and you have to make a lot of decisions. So if that's not your thing, that's not great. Um, and then last down here, um, you can do it all yourself. Um, so while if you want to do higher quality, you can do freelancers, there are tools today where you can do book layout, you can do covers, you could do absolutely everything. Um, I would claim that's, um, so it's definitely lowest cost, but you, know, you probably aren't going to be as good as professionals at that. And, and there's clearly a spectrum here, right? So you can hire freelancers for some things and not yourself. You can kind of figure that out however, however you want. So um, that's the options. I personally went with this because it represents my business, really cared about higher quality. Um, and separately, I don't think anyone, any traditional publisher was going to do a book on work anniversaries, as well as, I guess, another hidden thing in here. These days, traditional publishers generally only publish authors with really big um, social media followings. Um, and we'll, you know, may talk about that a little when we get to marketing, um, but that's, you know, that's the best way to sell books and they won't take a chance on that. And I did not have a large social media following. So that's where I ended up going. Um, in summary, these are the four options, you know, choose what makes sense for your project. All right, on to step three, um, writing the book. Um, there's an infinite amount of things one could say here and clearly not much time in this talk to do that. Um, I'm just going to share the three simple tips that made the biggest difference for my writing um, from all of this. Um, starting with tip one, which is write every day. 
This is very standard advice for writing. So any writing book you get will suggest this. If you um, read any interview with a famous author, they'll say they write every day. It doesn't matter how long you write. Um, professional authors will generally write three hours per day. Um, but the idea is you don't wait to be inspired. You don't wait for everything to be perfect. You just treat it like a job, and you get your, your time in. So that's tip number one. Um, so you're writing every day, what do you write? That's where tip number two comes in. Um, so writing a book's a big undertaking, so again, chunking things up. Um, outlining the entire book um, is a useful first step. So you create that outline. Um, and then from there, um, each day, you just look at your outline and pick the most interesting thing to you that day and fill in that part of the outline. Um, so you know, just kind of over and over, keep going. You'll adjust your outline as you go. As you write something, you'll think of something you missed or you'll you know, put something up. But you just keep every day show up, fill in your outline. And then the magic is the third step. Um, eventually, you get to a point where you don't want to write about any of the remaining topics. You simply delete them. And the thinking here is if it's not interesting for you to write, it's not going to be interesting to read. Um, you rejiggle your you know, chapters a little bit because you just deleted a bunch of stuff, and you're done. Um, so that's tip number two. Um, and this is, in the end, this is what my, or towards the end, this is what my outline looked like. And I just did it in a Google Doc. And so all it, well, all it did was I put headings in in the document and just wouldn't fill them in. And then I could do a table of contents automatically. And then when I went in to write, I could just click on a heading. It would take me right there. And so that was the tool for that. Um, and tip number three is don't revise your writing until after your first draft is complete. Um, it's just, um, yeah, it, it'll help you write faster because you don't have to think about it being good or that you're going to revise it too. Sections will get cut in the process, so anytime you spend revising will get lost um, and won't be worth it. Um, you'll learn about your topic as you write, and so when you revise later, you'll just kind of be smarter on your topic and that'll be useful, and you'll be more removed from that writing. And so it'll be more interesting for you to revise. So there's just all these reasons where it's just kind of, you know, not exactly stream of consciousness, but just write it out. If it's not perfect, don't worry. Um, it'll be fine. Um, all right. So in summary, these are my three favorite writing tips to both getting your book started and getting your book finished, um, which is useful. So all right. Now, assuming you finished your first draft, that brings us on to, um, so I said don't revise it, but that's the next step to revise it. Um, so um, before I started my book writing journey, I'd heard about editors, and I thought like a person had one editor, and the, an editor was a single person. Um, it turns out it's not. Um, there are four kinds of editors, um, the first of which is a developmental editor. Um, they, one way to think about them is they're answering the question of, does this have the potential to be a good book? So you know, they'll talk about you know, what sections to add or to remove or you know, shift the topic, delete whole whole parts of it, um, you know, that's the way they kind of think. They're not actually messing with the writing at all. Um, there's another kind of editor called a line editor. Um, this is like readability, like how, how, the question I would put in is, it's, is it written well? And like, is it fun to read? Um, but interestingly, they don't really care about grammar or spelling. <laughs> um, for that, you need another kind of editor called a copy editor. Um, they do grammar, and it turns out the grammar rules are kind of flexible, but the important thing is being consistent. So very much what a copy editor will be is making sure you're being consistent with whatever your approach is. Um, and then lastly, I don't know if this quite counts as an editor, but it's, it's very similar. Um, there's proofreading. Um, and here, they're really just looking for errors. Um, and um, generally, um, a book will go through this at least twice. Um, so super technical books may go through more than two proofreadings, but the standard thing is twice. Um, if you go through traditional publishing, they're going to take care of all this for you. If you go with vanity publishing, you want to make sure they do all these things. Or you're, you know, it's one of the places where your book comes to lower quality. And if you do it yourself, you have to figure out how you do all this. Um, so that's um, editors. Um, they're great and crucial, but a really interesting thing about editors is they're not your target market. Um, they're probably people who would not buy your book. Um, and so while they can make your writing better, they can't increase the underlying value of your book. They can't speak to, you know, that's a better book on Python, right? It, they just don't know. Um, and so for that, you need beta readers, um, which is the, so you had got them in the first step. Um, they are really helpful. The kinds of things that they'll tell you that the editors won't is where your book's hard to follow. Like, so things can be well written, but still you don't get the concepts. Um, they can do where you failed to be convincing, where you've inadvertently been insensitive to a group, right? So there's a way, if in my example, um, there was a part of my book that was insensitive to families that only had dads and no moms. 
you know, never meant to insult that, but that came up. There, there were all these other examples. There was a way in which my book, um, manufacturing companies, there were ways in which I used terminology that didn't make sense for them. So there's all these weird perspectives you might not have naturally that when you get beta readers in, they'll start telling you these things, and then you can fix them while it's still time, right? Because, you know, why not have a broader audience that would be able to value, benefit from your book? Um, they also tell you which things are really loved, which you can kind of amp up. And in my book, there's like call-outs now, where the lines that my beta readers really loved, if you look inside my book, there'll be places where you'll see like, hey, that was bold and brought out. That was because beta readers made it clear to me that that stuff mattered. Um, there are parts of my book that beta readers had really interesting ideas and thoughts about my book. And since it was early enough in the process, I just wrote them in. Um, so that was useful and good. Um, they also will tell you where they're skimming or skipping sections, or skipping chapters, right? And that will tell you, you know, where you might want to remove chapters or that. And most importantly, they'll tell you where they completely stopped reading and why. Um, this is enormously valuable. One way you can think of a book is like a video game where you're trying to get your reader to the end of the game. And if they get stuck at the introduction and stop reading, you know, they've, you know, they've, you know, game over at level one. Um, knowing that while you can solve it is really, really valuable. In my case, my introduction totally sucked. <laughs> um, and I had one brave beta reader tell me that in just horrible, excruciating detail how terrible it was. And she was so right. And the introduction is so much better now. <laughs> um, so that was really, really helpful. Um, so that's beta readers. Um, this summary is a little bit different. Um, so these are, you know, how all the steps fall into the process. Kind of that gray part is where, you know, you keep accepting the changes or looking through it. This is where, when I said don't revise until you finish your first draft, there's lots of steps for revision here. Um, so you will be able to make it better. Um, you will note kind of before the second proofreading is book design. Um, that's actually the next step. Um, so we will go into that. Um, so book design has four main components. Um, you have to choose the size of the book. You have to design the cover. Um, any diagrams or illustrations need designed. And the interior layout and typography is a really big part of the design. Um, in my case, um, the book is 8.5 by 5.5. And, and every kind of book has its own sizes. And so you, you kind of want to get the run that feels right. Um, covers are really important and hard. The cover has to be look good when it's a full-size book, and it also has to look good on Amazon because people do judge the books by their cover. Um, in my case, we did over a dozen different variations, and I tested it with my actual market to figure out which one they like best. It turned out it was this one. Um, and then the f actual image file does the back cover and the front cover, and the spine is real specific. It has to be the exact width for the number of pages you have, and designers know how to do that, which is useful. Um, diagrams and illustrations are really important that they be designed well. Um, and then the interior, there's so many decisions to make on fonts um, and the headings, the bullets, um, what that first page of a chapter looks like. Those are all different. And I claim if that's done by an amateur, it's really obvious. Um, and so that's an important part of design. Um, so again, there's the summary. Those are the four big things you're going after. All right, on to... Part six, um, distribute. Um, so at this point, you know, you've, you've written all the words and you've designed the book. You actually have files, you know, digital files that can be turned into books. Um, you have to essentially answer two questions. The first one is what format are you going to put out? So you can do ebook, you can do print, you can do audiobook, you can do any combination of these. Um, that's going to affect how you distribute. Um, and depending on your audience and what you're trying to achieve, um, you know, some subset of those will make sense. Um, the audiobook is, you know, generally the more expensive of the three, um, so that'd be the most likely one to leave off. Um, and then the second question is, which distributors are you going to use? Um, so the most obvious thing to do is go with Amazon. Um, somewhere between 16 and 70% of the books in the world are sold through Amazon, so if you're not there, that's an interesting choice. Um, but um, there clearly are other places. So if you want to be in local bookstores, um, Ingram Spark is the um, big distributor you might go with. Um, for your ebook, Draft to Digital is the big distributor um, for getting that out to all. There's lots of places that sell ebooks, but Draft to Digital will get it all to all of them. Um, and then Find Away Voices is the big other distributor for audiobooks. Um, they're owned by Spotify now. Um, and basically, you need to choose what you're going to do here. Um, in my case, I chose to go with all the formats and all the distributors, um, which was a bit of a pain because that meant I had five you different. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. 
I'm glad there wasn't a tie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so anyway, so there's all these user interfaces you have to sign into. It's a pain, but the upside is the book is now available tons of places. So this is just one site that lists the places my book's available. That's not even all of them. Um, you can get it on target.com. You can get it on Walmart, which does generally have the best price um, for any given format. Um, and so that works out. Um, so summary, um, distributing, you, know, you just have to answer these two questions um, and then set it all up. Um, all right, on to the last step, marketing. Um, again, marketing is a topic you could talk for forever about, but I'm gonna keep it pretty simple here. Um, and that is, um, essentially, there's three simple questions you, can, you need to answer um, as an amateur marketer. One is, who can benefit from your book? So think about who, who really you know, this would add to their lives. Um, how will you let them know it exists? So how do you, how do you talk to these people that you think will benefit? and what will convince them that it's worth their time and money. And in marketing, the terms for this is you're figuring out your target market, you're figuring out your channel, and you're figuring out what your message is gonna be. And so that's the simple thing. And again, you could do so much more, but that's sort of the minimum. Um, and so that's the summary there. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Here's the complete summary. So everything I summarized mm -hmm. up there. Um, and I would claim you can do this, none of it's you know, rocket surgery. Um, and all right, so I did promise the AI thing. How I would put that in is the yellow things are what I would claim AI is not going to help you very much, and the blue things are where you know, AI probably isn't going to do a super high quality, amazing job on its own, but where you could get significant assistance um, on those things. Um, and uh, you know, that's a thing. You know, probably kind of the interesting ones here is developmental editing. I think AI could do, but there's no training set available because no, no good authors put out the, here's the crappy early version I read that my developmental editor trashed and here's what they said about it. Like that's, that's just something that's going to remain private um, for a long time. So even though it could, it doesn't have a training set. Um, but, and a lot of the other things are kind of physical. Diagrams are interesting. Diagrams, maybe someday it could, but like figuring out from your book how to do a good diagram is just hard. So at least that's my um, opinion on that. And that's it. So. <laughs> Questions, first hand. Uh, the most challenging part. That's a hard question. Like it, uh, so in the spirit of my talk, no section was really all that hard, right? It's like, so I guess it really comes down to just staying focused on the part that you're working on. Um, the, the editing and revising section took the longest. And I probably, I, 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 that was the one that took unexpectedly the longest. Like there were so many steps of going to some professional, it coming back, you know, dealing with that. So that, that took longer than I'd expect. But I guess in the theme of the talk, none of it was hard. Um, so, Alex? I was going to ask some kind of similar, like, which we're stuck kind of took along. But so for the uh, editing and revising, you said that you went with the option to uh, pay freelancers. Did you have to find, like, a developmental freelancer and then a then whatever, line editor? Or, or was there, like, a, a freelancer that knew people that could do it? Or was it, like, a company you hired that was a freelancer? So those are all options. <laughs> um, so could have done any of those things. Um, I had what was I hired what was known is known as a book shepherd, which is someone who has had a lot of experience in the publishing industry and seen lots of books and they just know stuff. And so they're just this wise person that goes on the journey alongside you. And so they would know, like, like basically for the development letter, they just went, Peter, like he, this would be the gr great book for Peter to work on. Let's see if Peter's available. And then would you know, have Peter's contact information and search him out. And so I did have a guide that would kind of do that sort of thing. Um, sometimes, you know, Peter wouldn't be available, whoever it was, and you know, we'd scramble. But yeah, that, having a book shepherd made this, that whole process a lot easier. That is, that is, uh, let's run our way back there. That is entirely common. Maybe, maybe this was a bad idea to try and go back. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is this is very standard. Yeah, no. I guess the the thing that's not standard is beta reading is not especially standard. Um, there are a lot of folks who will skip that step, and I think that's tragic. Basically, I spend a lot of time in product management, and so like, for me, that's especially tragic. We're like, what do you mean you didn't test it with users before you put all that money into it? So anyway, so I think that's dumb to leave that out, but everything else is standard. Okay. So, um, Did you the elevator pitch on your book? Uh, the elevator pitch on my book. Um, it's, sorry, not while I'm blinking all this. Um. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it's um, it's it's basically so it's not exactly oh, this sort of depends how long the elevator in New York City the elevator pitch is um, that work anniversaries can't show favoritism they aren't that important and so they're going to be low cost and low effort and those are some really big challenges to overcome and you still want to do something meaningful and memorable. And one of the things, one of the ways I'll actually talk about it is like, so imagine you have to, you know, imagine you have a spouse, for those of you who don't. Um, imagine you have a spouse and you're getting them a gift and you get them the same gift that, you know, everybody else gets their spouse and you don't spend much money on it. You don't put any effort into it. That's like just the world's crappiest gift. Um, that's the challenge work anniversaries are against. Um, and so how do you, how are you up against that and how do you do something memorable and meaningful? The book talks about those challenges and how you pull it off anyway. That was a long elevator, right? <laughs> nice. <laughs> I have one friend who did that. I don't know how it's going. Um, do you read a lot? Do I read a lot? Yes. Um, so I do. I do read a lot of books. And the thing that like like I, I have this great. I guess the karmic problem I have is not only do I read a lot, but I buy a lot of books. And in this process, I suddenly realized I've probably only read half the books I've bought. <laughs> and, and my problem is now, I'm like, people are buying my book, and I'm like, about half of them aren't reading it. <laughs> so I'm endeavoring to read more of the books I buy now. What is the financial burden coming to this point? What is the financial? So how much the total? Um, it is thousands of dollars, and it's scary enough I haven't added it up. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, one, I, I probably won't, you know, I did go for, because it's representing my business, I did go for really high quality and went for, you know, and when I say freelancers, like, you can go really low end on Fiverr, or you can really get professionals out of the industry. I did go professionals out of the industry. Um, my thought is it will represent the business well, and it will be a good piece of marketing, and that might mean be deluding myself <laughs> now for all to hear. So, uh, yes. Do you have a sense of how much of this would also be applicable to fiction or which parts would change? Uh, so, testing the idea is an intriguing thing in fiction, right? So, if you're really into selling your book, so a lot of times people just have their idea and want to do it, but you could test, like you can. I actually have a buddy who's doing a um, kid's book um, that my 10-year-old daughter is beta reading for him. So, so you can do that, but that's not typical. Um, how to publish is the same. Writing, again, your style, like you can outline the plot and f figure out the stuff, and you can do that, though not everyone would. Like, so I claim every nonfiction book probably should have an outline. Fiction gets a little weirder. Editing, revising, that's all the same um, process, including beta reading. and the. This is changing genres on you, but like what made the early Pixar movies great is that they had beta viewing, and they would have lots of kids seeing who, where they got bored and where they laughed, and they'd keep redoing it. So, so again, beta reading can be amazing for fiction if you're into it. Um, design, distribute, um, you know, are all the same market, yeah, same audience. So a lot of it, really what it comes down to is how much do you just feel your story's in you and you're going to tell your story no matter what, and how much are you trying to create a marketable product would be the difference. Um, is that? Do you have any tips for like, how you manage like, research along with how you were writing for a So I cut that slide. So clearly this, <laughs> cut this talk went long. <laughs> Um, but uh, so there were a number of slides I had to cut, but I did cut that. But what I did um, in my process, so in that process where I said that you know you create an outline, then you fill it in, and then you cut the parts that you're done. What I actually did was did the I had a loop in one of my slides where I did the research as I went, and um, I found this um, really great site called Respondent.io, which basically allows you to talk to any LinkedIn people that have any LinkedIn profile you want. 
And so I have sections in my book for marketing and for human resources and you know, all these different you know, categories of people. And I could just be like, I want to talk to marketing people today. And Respondent.io would give me those people. And that was actually what would then inspire my filling in the outline because you know, somebody would say something on one of my Respondent.io calls and be like, well, that was interesting. And I'd fill in that section that day. So um, yeah, so, and different books are different. But if you can do user research while you're writing the book, that will make the writing really easy and going to the point of there was no hard part, like I was just on some level writing up the interesting thing I heard that day. Um, so, yeah. Uh, all right, other... Uh, so, beta readers were my, um, a lot of ex-colleagues that I'd still be in touch with kind of found out I was doing it and were willing to do it. Um, I posted on LinkedIn, so it's very a businessy book, um, and strangers came in from LinkedIn. That was a good sign that people I didn't know would beta read. Um, and, um, and my daughter, my 10-year-old daughter wanted to. Um. <laughs> Um, and actually, to tie that together, that thing where I said the introduction was lousy and it was great that people told me that, my daughter actually started to read my book and read a couple pages and she like, gave up and just was like, yeah, this isn't a book for like 10-year-olds, which of course it wasn't. And I, and I left it at that, right? I'm like, cool, thanks for trying. That was awesome. Um, but then that person told me how horrible my introduction was. I completely rewrote the introduction. Um, and then just for fun, I gave that to my daughter. And she raced through it, and she wrote all over it, and she drew like these like this will sound silly, but like these anger emojis because she was upset about something, and then she drew these happy emojis because she was happy, and she like made it all the way through the full the full introduction, and it was kind of clear that if you write a good introduction, it can be more universal, and so that was actually an amazing test where I'm like, yeah, I think I got the introduction now, so my daughter was useful on that. Uh, cool. Other questions. Uh, that if you're a busy person, so I mean that's that's kind of for, so I don't have a broader opinion other than if you're a busy person and the book is going to be useful to your business, that's a completely reasonable thing. Um, I guess another place where I've seen that useful is there's certain people who writing just isn't their thing, but they love to talk to people. And so you can just have conversations with a ghostwriter and like, and again with the goal, how do you get your useful information out to the world? For the kind of person who's just better at conversations than writing, that's an amazing way to get the information out. Also, for someone who's really busy and just wants it to happen faster, um, you know, then it won't be as much what they're saying, but that's another awesome. So they're both good options. And again, that falls in the freelancer category of you can get amazing ghostwriters you know, if you, know, you can choose whatever level you want, and so very viable. Um, all right, other questions? Did you Sadly, the advice is that you're not, you shouldn't do that. And I would, like, I really wanted to. I thought that'd be really fun. But I, I got a lot of advice saying authors should not narrate their own books. Um, and so I was thinking I was still going to do it anyway. But then the audio production company I was going with, they have one price for if you have a narrator and one price if you do it yourself. <laughs> and you'd, you'd think the price would be lower if you do it yourself, right? Um, and I was like, yeah, that'd be good. But it's way higher because. <laughs> They care, again, I was going for quality in the work I did, but they, and the company I went with cares about quality, and because they don't want lousy books going out under their name, they put a speaking coach next to you the entire time you read it, and the speaking coach will be like, nope, you flubbed that, nope, go redo that. And it's cheaper to pay somebody who's a good narrator than to pay someone who's a good coach of narrators, which makes sense, right? Um, and so anyway, so it ended up being a lot more expensive. It was going to take a lot more time. And they were saying it was going to be worse. So I didn't do it. <laughs> so. Well, we look forward to the director's cut. Like, if you want to make your own like, bootleg version of your book, well, we can listen to it. You can be beta listeners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Rick.